The second type of lease is a variable lease. A variable lease is a change in the rental rate inside of the lease. So it's important. If you sign a one-year lease at $1,000 and then you renew the lease at $1,100, that is not a variable lease. That are That is two leases with just two different lease rates. What I'm talking about is a change in the rental rate during the time frame of the lease. So you start here and say, well, it's a three-year lease. But, and this is used a lot in helping smaller businesses get started, the landlord may say, look, the first year we're going to be at this rental rate, and then the second year it's going to jump up, and then the third year it's going to jump up again. And you have a scheduled increase within the time frame of one lease. This would be a variable lease. In this example, this variation is called a graduated, meaning it got higher. This is very common. I have been in my spot renting for probably 18 years now. We started out at a rental rate that was very low because the school was just starting and the landlord said, look, I'll try and help you out. I don't want to get you to the point where you can't pay and end up moving out, which looking back at it now in this example makes brilliant sense. If he was trying to charge me this rental rate the first couple months, I may have closed because I'm like, Duck, dude, I'm not doing a new business. I'm a brand new school. I got to quit. And I might have closed down the school in the first year and he may have got one year's worth of rent. But by helping me out when we started, I now have been here 18 years. <laughs> he has more than made up for this percentage or this little bit that he gave me a break. So this is very common to have some kind of graduated lease. The second type of variable lease is analogous to that arm loan. Remember the arm, the adjustable rate where it follows some index. There is a financial index and then they put a, a margin on it. And when that index went up, the loan interest rate went up. Same concept here where they may say, hey, your lease rate is tied to the consumer price index. If the consumer price index goes up, that means the market's good. Therefore, your rental rate's going to go up. If the consumer price index goes down, the market's a little depressed. We will lower your interest rate to follow so that you don't go out of business. That is an index lease. That These are the two types of variable. But the key to remember is the variation is within that least time frame. Don't fall for the trick it is, on the exam. It is not two distinct leases that have different prices. That Those are two fixed leases with just different fixed amounts. Okay? Now, there's some other esoteric types of leases that you might get into. And typically, most of this other stuff is, once again, in that higher commercial type of world. The first one being a ground lease. A ground lease is kind of like the first evolution of the commercial world. If you remember back in another chapter, we talked about that you cannot depreciate land. The IRS and taxes do not allow you to write off the loss in value of land because land doesn't lose value. It always is worth more. So why would a company like Chili's want to own land? 
because they can't depreciate it. So what happens a lot is where they might lease the ground at some rental rate to a, the owner because that rental rate becomes rent and they get to deduct the rent off of their income as an expense. So they will rent the ground and they then may own the building and that building they do get to deduct depreciation. So it is the first evolution that we talked about for companies to actually make more money because they don't own the land. They rent it under a ground lease. They own the building because the whoever owned the ground sold them the airspace. Remember that? We could do that. So the Chili's in this example would own the building and it does depreciate. And they use that, uh, if you recall, that straight line depreciation. Remember, they get to write that off that taxes. And now they get to write the rate, rent of the ground. That is called a ground lease. That is the first one. It allows them to depreciate the building because they have a separate ownership. And it allows them to build on property they don't own. And now they get to deduct that rental rate. We're going to jump down here because that, what we just talked about, is the first version of something we talked about prior called a sale leaseback. Now, in the next version of this ground lease, let's go one step more. They actually lease the building from the owner. And if you remember, we talked about CVS will build a building and they will have a mortgage for $2 million. Then what they do, that ownership now in this case includes the land. So they own the land in the building. And then they sell that entire thing to an investor and then lease it back. And now that is a short-term expense and they are leasing the entire project. They are leasing the building and the land and whatever that amount is, is actually an expense they get to write off every year. So this is the second version or the advanced version of the ground lease. This, the ground lease, where are we at? The ground lease, they lease the ground and own the building. In this version, they actually lease all of it. They lease the ground and the building from the owner. All right? So it's the second version. Now, there are things called oil and gas leases. Remember the subsurface rights that we get? Maybe there's gas inside of my land or there's oil inside of my land. I'm going to tell you now, there are a lot of different rules that vary based on each state. So you need to look that maybe in some states you don't own the oil. There's called a migration law. Uh, because the oil may move from one property to another, you may not own that. We're not going to get real in depth, but just remember or understand that there is a possibility that the owner of the land could receive cash for a company doing exploration rights to determine if there's oil or gas. This next one is also a second version of something we have talked about. And we have mentioned previous in this chapter that there could be a lease with an option to buy at the end. Well, the problem with the lease or the option to buy is the fact that the option is truly an option. 
meaning that tenant could say, no, I don't want to do that. Well, there is a little stronger version of this called a lease with a purchase. This is where the tenant might lease the property. And then at the end of the lease, they are contractually obligated to buy the property. And that lease is the secondary, meaning it's just there to try and facilitate some time for that uh, tenant to become the owner. And you might use this in an example of, let's say a couple's getting divorced and they don't live together yet, but they're not legally divorced. And one tenant tells the landlord, look, dude, I can't buy it yet because I'm going through this divorce. When my divorce is final, I wanna buy. So you could offer that seller a lease purchase. Or someone is saying, I am working on getting my credit restored over the next six months, but I don't want to lose this property, so I will lease it from you, and at the end of the six months, I will then buy it. That's the lease purchase, okay? It is the a little stronger version than the lease option, because the option gives an option to the tenant to go no, where a lease purchase is not an option. It's a contractual obligation, okay? So once that lease gets formed and started, there has to be some way to discharge or terminate that lease. And there are several ways. Now, of course, I told you the first one was called a tenancy or an estate for years. There has to be no notice given for that because it knows when it ends. Definite beginning, definite end. So there's no notice required for that one. Parties can actually mutually agree to cancel the lease. Once again, anybody can agree to do anything as long as it's legal and both parties agree. So even if there's seven months to go on, the, on this estate for years, the tenant comes to you and goes, hey, dude, I got a chance to buy the property. I want to end of my lease. And the landlord goes, that's okay. I've got another tenant looking that's going to pay more than you're paying. So let's agree to terminate your lease. The tenant can actually surrender and just quit if the landlord accepts it. Once again, they both agree. So that's the mutual release. If the tenant abandons the property, that could be grounds for trying to, the landlord to try and get those reversionary interests right. You're going to talk about this. This may be that eviction case that we're going to talk about. 